want to welcome you guys to the doctor's report. It's my favorite visit because this is where Dr. Osborne gets to sit down with you guys and just really explain to you what it is that we do in the office, our mission, and how we see so many people's lives change by just working with the nervous system and showing them what, what true health and healing really comes from. So for those of you who don't know Dr. Osborne, he's been practicing for 24 years. Um, throughout those 24 years, he's traveled all over the world training with the top doctors in spinal research and some of some top not just doctors but also scientists and researchers basically in spinal health and nervous system neurology basically and so you know for I've been in your shoes right here I've been in this seat uh, my first quarter of school I actually that's when I met Dr. Osborne and I came I came for a doctor's report and really you know it just changed my whole life um, at the time I got into chiropractic school just thinking it was all about neck pain and back pain and it wasn't until I met Dr. Osborne to where my whole world just, you know, really flipped upside down. I met him. He taught me about the nervous system. He taught me about true health and true healing and where it really comes from that. Where our outside in, our body has the most amazing capabilities to be able to regenerate, repair, and heal itself. And that's what he did for me. That's why I get really excited because that's what he's going to do for you today. All right, so I'm going to go get him and then we're going to get started, okay, all right? Okay. You guys want to see something? Oops. You have to get fast forward in there. Come on. What happened there? Hey, Dr. Carlos? Yeah. That was the fastest doctor's report ever. Okay. <laughs> so, you guys know what this is? Empty bottles. Uh, they're actually full. Yeah. They're full like that. This, this is actually from the last couple months. So, uh, how do you think I collect them besides going into people's purses and stealing them from them? <laughs> <laughs> They don't require them anymore. Right, so think about this. Like, so do healthy people take these things? And the way you know that if it's good for you is that if, if, you're, if you take it when you're healthy, do you get healthier? As opposed to, like, do you take it when you're sick, do you actually get sicker? A lot of times prescriptions are just a permission for us to keep on living our life the same way that we do. And, and so really what I want you guys to understand, the reason why I showed you is it's, uh, I was just looking at it in the back. And, you know, we have... Um, like Dr. Carlos said, we, we do a lot of things, and we, you notice we do things very different in this office. And the only reason we, why we do that is that I've been around for 24 years. Um, I've adjusted 630,000 plus adjustments in this office. So after that, that amount of time, you know what works and you know what doesn't work. Does that make sense? Like you, you know that even with trial and error, you can kind of figure it out. And we have people that live in Monterey, we have people that live in Humboldt, we have people that live in Sacramento and San Luis Obispo, we have people that fly in from across the country and they stay here for weeks and months at a time to get care in the office. Uh, literally passing thousands of chiropractors along the way. And why would people do that? Because what we do, what? Works. Does that make sense? It's what, it works. And that's the plain and simple thing. Nobody would do that if it didn't work. And, and the only reason why it works and what I found is, is that we have the most educated patients. That's the only reason. I don't want to have a doctor-doctor, doctor-patient relationship with you. I want to have a doctor-doctor relationship with you. Because does anybody know where the best doctor, the most best doctor in the world lives? Inside of us. Amen. Right there. It's right, right there, right? Yeah. I mean, this is a cheat sheet right it. up there. But the point of that is this: is that you, you're, you, have, you I, I, no doctor's ever done healing. You know, we, I, I'll adjust somebody, but the power inside of you does the healing. And so, what I, what we need to have is a healthy relationship like that. And that's why I take this time tonight. Because it'd be just, it'd be easy for me to just say, hey, take some x-rays, I don't even have to go over them with you, um, but just do what I tell you to do and follow what I tell you to follow blindly. But then what happens is that becomes this codependent chiropractic thing. And I don't want to be this codependent chiropractor, I want to be a partner in this with you and make sure that I empower you to be able to make good decisions as you move forward so that we don't end up where we are right now in the future there. And that's the big key, because a lot of times when we look at our spine, when we look at our life, where we are right now it's just a complete reflection of our life up until this point. Every emotional stress that we've had, every physical stress that we've had, every chemical stress that we've had, every, every salad that we've eaten, and every Big Mac that we've eaten has had is an impact on us at this point. Every time we look down at our phone or every time we look up at the heavens had an impact on our, on, our, on our bodies there. And so when we realize that everything matters, well then what we do is we realize it's, our, it's not where we are, but it's our choices that has got us to this point. And so my job is to be able to give you the tools to make better decisions so that when we look forward in 30 years from now, 
that we're gonna be in a completely different place. And that's really what my job is, is I wanna look forward in 30 years from now and know that I've done my very best job. So that by you being here, you're actually healthier than you would have been um, in 30 years from now, that you're gonna live a longer and happier, healthier life, that you're off less medications, that you know that you exercise more and you feel fitter, that you're there for your grandkids. Like that's my goal there. It's not just about bad backs or bad necks. And in fact, that's why I'm gonna, when we go old, when we're done, I'm gonna teach you how to read your x-rays now, not because I wanna teach you, but I already know how to read x-rays. Like it's easy for me, but I want you, when you're looking at your x-rays, to know exactly what you're looking at. Because if you know what you're looking at, then you can have a better understanding, and then your why becomes big enough. You're, because if it's just about bones, if it's just about back pain or neck pain, it would be simple. I'd just give you a pill, and then you wouldn't feel the pain, and then it would go away. Well, that's, our, that's kind of our way of looking at things in the United States, right? We take 99% of the oxycodone in the entire planet. That's crazy. That's crazy, right? We take 90% of the painkillers, and overall, we take 80% of the medications in the entire world. We're 5% of the world's population. We go to the doctor more, we spend more on healthcare, and we, according to the World Health Organization, we're 70th in the world as far as health and well-being of our population. So if all it took to be healthy and to live a long, healthy life would be to be taking medications, going to our doctors, and doing everything that everybody else is doing, we should be doing great. But we're 70th in the world. There's the dozens of third world countries that people live longer, healthier, happier lives. So either we're doing everything right or we're doing things wrong. And there, what I need you to understand is that what we call there's a common process, there's a common place, what the common person is doing over here. And the common person is waiting till they have a problem. Like, just think about cancer, right? By the time you feel cancer, you know that it's, it, it takes about eight to nine years, up to 10 years for cancer to develop. So once it starts developing, it takes 10 years approximately before you feel it. And so by the time you feel it, it's what? Too late. Too late, right? So when would you want to know if you had cancer? Right. That's why. I mean, that's why when you're 50 years old, you get the you know the the, the, the exam, right? That's why they do breast the, like they do breast exams because you don't want to wait until there's a problem, and that's why we actually do spinal exams. That's why we check your spine because by the time we feel problems in our spine, that means that there's been enough damage going on for a long enough period of time that now your body can't adapt to it anymore. That we're in crisis there. The other thing that you look at, like heart disease, you know, one in four people. Half the people that have a heart attack, that's their very first symptom of having a heart disease. We know that of those people, half of those people will die of that heart attack. So you got a one in four chance of actually dying from a heart attack feeling good. That's worse than Russian roulette. Like you, you have better chances taking a revolver, taking one bullet in there, spinning it, and clicking the revolver, and, and taking that as your, and, and then basing your health on how you feel as a heart attack. Unfortunately, we wait until we are in crisis, and then, then we try to cover up the crisis with medications so our prescriptions become a permission to continue to live our same lifestyle. You know, when we look at our blood pressure, right, we don't take our dog's blood pressure. Is, is anybody taking your dog's blood pressure recently? You check his cholesterol, you know, like you're looking, because we assume that the dog knows how to heal. Does that make sense? We assume that the dog is self-regulating. But then the problem is, is when we start looking at us, we forget that we are brilliant and we are powerful, that our bodies do know how to work right. And so then what we try to do is we try to macro, micromanage things. We try to take you know, an abnormal situation and try to make it normal. Look, if you're running from a, a water buffalo and then you sit in your doctor's office and he takes your blood pressure and it's high, you're like, oh, we need to get you on medications. You'd be like, no, I was just running from a water buffalo. <laughs> and you go, oh, that makes sense. But nobody ever asks those questions. There's always a cause. Does that make sense? And, and there's always an effect. And we just, if we, have, if we deal in effects, then we never get to the cause. So when somebody comes into the office, like one of the things is, let's say you come in with a, a low back issue. Low back hurts. Well, when you have low back pain, that means that you have damage to the spine and the low back. The spine is there, literally that's armor there protecting the spinal cord. And so this armor protects the spinal cord. So if you have damage to the armor, you have damage to the spinal cord, you have damage to the nerves, your brain controls the function of your entire body. It literally sends messages down the spinal cord, out the nerves to every single tissue, cell, and organ. So for your heart to beat, life literally has to flow down into that heart, otherwise it doesn't beat. For your lungs to breathe, life has to flow to those lungs. For you to see me right now, life has to flow to those eyes, and afterwards when you get something to eat, life has to flow to those, those, those intestines for you to digest. So if we, remember Professor Guillotine? You guys ever like read about him, like the French Revolution, oh. right? Yeah, so he did an experiment. And so what he did is he said, what happens if we interfere, remember he made the guillotine, 
So if, if we interfere with the brain communicating to the body, what happened? There was the thing that went shoo, right? Like life stopped. So what would happen if I cut the nerves to the heart? Life stops, right? If I, if I cut the nerves to the lungs, life stops. But what happens, what if I cut the nerves to the eyes? What happens to your vision? You go blind. But what happens if I have a slow growing tumor that slowly grows? It puts just a little bit of pressure. At first, it's, you're not gonna even know it. But then a little bit more pressure, you might get some distorted vision, but you can still see. But over time, as that tumor gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what eventually happens to your vision? You go blind. So the only difference between cutting that nerve and pr pressure on that nerve is just time. And that's why when I look right down here, if somebody's got a low back issue, this isn't a low back issue to me. This is a health issue. If you have a problem in your neck, what's it going to affect? Everything down below. Does that make sense? So this right here, this is a life issue. So whether you had a big toe issue or a shoulder issue or a right wrist issue, I'm always going to check this area right here. We always want to know because we don't want to guess. We want to test. We want to know exactly what's going on there. So that's why when you come in, I need you to understand your, your, your x-rays because here's the thing, most of us base our, like, we base our health on how we feel. We try to cover it up, but we know that health, that isn't a really good approach. So then we gotta come up with what's a different definition of health. Like if that's not working, if the average person, their healthy life expectancy is 69 years old, that means we wake up in the morning for 65 years, right? And we go to work, we miss our kids' events, we do all these things, we, we stress and all these, you know, we go to work and do all these things, and then we retire at 65, and then the average person has four good years, and then they spend the next 10 years, because the average life expectancy in the United States is 79 years old, just struggling, struggling to stay alive. Does that make sense? We just go to the doctor, and, you know, my, my in-laws are in that place where they're just going to the doctor pretty much three times a week. They actually moved to Boise so that they could be near the hospital so they wouldn't have to commute very far there. It's crazy. I mean, the average person in the nursing home now spends $127,000 and nobody wakes up, you know, starts off at 18 saying, hey, look, I want to end up in the nursing home. We all want to end up on the cruise ship. But something happens between 18 and, and where we are. And that's what my job is, to make sure that, you know, we all end up on the cruise ship because there's so much more in store for us. We, we know that, that if you look in the Bible, it says that we're supposed to live to 120 years old in Genesis. That's what it says. If you look at Harvard, Harvard cells are, says our cells even aren't, supposed, aren't even supposed to go through pre-programmed cell death until we're 120 years old. And Discover Magazine said, looking at all the research, the first 150-year-old person has already been born. Who is it? Is it you? Is it you? I don't know. Like, but that's the point, is if you know that's our potential and we're just all excited about making it to 80, oh my gosh, we're, under, we're underselling ourselves. But the problem is, is that most people, I was to say, hey look, um, I just want to let you know, and talk to God. He says you're you will live to a hundred years old, guaranteed right now. Guaranteed. Like first thing that goes through most people's minds, like how many people want to live to hundred knowing the people that are living to hundred right now? Yeah. Does that make sense? They don't exactly. know what their name is. Yeah. You know, one in two people yeah. over eighty five don't even know their own name. Uh, they they're tubes and they don't can't hear, they can't see. Mm -hmm. and the problem is is that when you look at the average person that was born that's 100 years old right now, their life expectancy was 60 years old when they were born. They never thought they were going to make it to 100. But if we are going to live to 100, 120, like when today right now is the youngest that you'll ever be, what's the time that we need to start making some dis different decisions? Does that make sense? We need to start planning that we're going to live to 100. And, and acting in that way, because uh, if we're not, it's going to either we're not going to make it or it's going to be a miserable existence. And so that's what my job is. Health isn't how we feel. That's a really bad way because then we're living our life in crisis. Health is how we function. That's what the World Health Organization says. And that's why we look at the brain. Your brain controls that function there. And so when we look at this, the, re the reason why I, I, I go into this, because I need you to understand that from the front, your spine has to be completely straight. There's no deviations. There's no just a little bit off or a little, you know, a lot off. When we look at a spine, if, imagine if I was to walk into a kindergarten classroom and I was going to ask kindergartners, like, "Am I healthy or sick if my spine looks like this?" What would they say? Sick. sick. There's not even a question, right? They'd be, okay, so if that's sick, what's that? Does it make sense? Uh, and it, it, even like that, because there's no small curves. It's like being a little bit pregnant. You either are or you're not. Either you're functioning at 100 percent or you're not functioning at 100 percent. And so when you look at it, you're gonna, there's a tendency to, when to, I took your x-rays coming this way, okay? In the computer, I flipped them around. 
So when you're looking at your x-rays, it's, it's as if you're looking at your back. This is your right side, and this will be your left side. So here's the spine, here's your hips and your pelvis. This is in the low back here. From the side, you need to have three nice smooth curves, 45, 45, and 45. This is, the, the, when they make the great cathedrals, the arches, they're in 45 degree angles. Does that make sense? Like all the, the you know, the, the St. Louis arch, 45 degree angle, that's what allows it to stay up and be, stay stable. Your spine has to have those curves there. That's what the research shows. And when it's not like that, what it does is it starts to collapse in on itself. It just starts to crumble there. And so when we look at the spine, we want to have that nice smooth curve. Here's the vertebra, they should be nice and square. Here's the disc spaces right here. And here's the nerve holes coming back here. What I want us to think about though when we look at the x-ray is not what the x-ray is there. You know, I want us to look at the bones. What I want you to think about is what the bones are there to protect. Hopefully it works, there we go. Look at that. That's what it protects. There's not a lot of room for error in there. Does that make sense? If we have a twisting like this or a shifting, think about that. When we, if you were to take your leg right now and you leave it like that, what's going to happen in about half an hour? Fall asleep. It's going to fall asleep. Any pain? Because think about it. Like you go to a movie, right? Well, you have to move it. Dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you actually have to use it, right? Yeah. But we lose the function before we actually have the pain. And if you left that pressure on that nerve that's going down your foot for, um, you know, a, a, a week. Eventually the, the nerve would die, right? Sure. And then eventually, the, the no matter how much you wished and how many drugs that you gave it, there's nothing that you could do to regenerate that nerve. And studies show that within 30 minutes, that nerve actually uh, starts to break down. You lose about 40% function with about 30 minutes when you have pressure on a nerve. Watch, watch this. So I bend to the side right here. It's not that all of a sudden my nerve dies. Does that make sense? But it takes about 30 minutes for us to lose that function. So that's why if you're laying on the couch, in that type of position, you're sitting in a car in that type of position for a long trip, that's where we start to have issues there. The problem is, is that you're designed to be able to bend, and that's the gloriousness about you, but you're not designed to stay there, and that's the problem. When we have a curve like that, it's devastating to the human nervous system and the human body. Because what happens is, is that every single day, your body's breaking down. Every single day, it happens. We lose about 10 billion cells a day, and every single day, your body's regenerating itself. That's the cool thing about it. That's what, it, and so what happens is, let's say we're talking about the heart. The heart says, hey, look, I need 100,000 new cells. Brain goes, hey, I know exactly what to do. Sends 100,000 new cells down to the heart. Well, the problem is, if I have pressure on that nerve, the message that the brain gets is not that I need 100,000 new cells, it just gets, I need 40, 60,000 healthy cells. Brain goes, cool, I know exactly what to do. Creates the perfect environment, you get 60,000 healthy cells but you get 40,000 sick cells. The next day it's 80,000 sick cells. The next day it's 120, 160, 200,000. And you do the math, and you build, get enough sick cells, what kind of heart are you gonna have? A healthy heart or sick heart? Sick heart. That's, that's the difference. That's what aging is. is when did Where do those nerves go? Well, and that's, that, that's, that, that's my point on that, is the, all these nerves go out to all the different organs there. So what if there's pressure on just on this one? Do you think there's gonna be a devastating effect? And that's the point That's the point I want to make here is that if this nerve has pressure, just that one little one, it's either building healthy cells or sick cells. And you get enough healthy cells, just like in the heart, it's sick cells in the heart, in your body, just like in the heart, then you get a sick body. That's all, that, that's what we're either re degenerating or regenerating. So when I look at you know, a spine like this, you may have heard of scoliosis. Spine's down. Yeah, okay. So scoliosis, the, uh, the average life expectancy for somebody with scoliosis is 14 to 21 years less if their curve is over 21, uh, 24 degrees. Why would that be? Degenerating. Sure. Six cells. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like literally, this isn't my, I even put the references down there on that because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't making this up. This is, and just so you guys know, when I talk, I'll give you my opinion, I'll let you know it's my opinion on something, but just assume right now that everything I'm telling you is fact, because that's where I operate. But what happens is, is that if you look at this person, they build a healthy cells or sick cells. And the thing about Anne, she, here's what happens. She's at Burger King, she walks into my office, one of two people in the entire planet that have ever gone to Burger King and walked into my office. It's just like, it just doesn't happen, you know what I mean? Like literally, you, you eat at Burger right King. There. I know, you, you eat at Burger King though, you've really given up on your 70s already, so you're like, why would I even try to get healthy? So the point was, so she walks in and she says, can you help me? 
I said, well, what's going on? She told me her story, and she said, they want to stick rods into my spine uh, because my spine's just collapsing down on itself. And I, so we did. We took this x-ray, and I looked at it, and I'm like, it's too late. Like, I, I can't. There's, there's a point at which I can help somebody, and there's a point that I can't. And the, the reason why you guys are here is because I can help you. That's not even a question. Like, I never start on a case that I can't help. Because all it does is frustrate you, it frustrates me, nobody wins, and nobody's happy there. And, and there's people that were here at the same exam, same x-rays, and we already referred them out to the ortho or the neuro or the oncologist, um, just because we can't help them. Like, there's just too much damage. She ended up having the spine fused. The thing that makes me angry, the reason why I show this picture, she was at 16 years old. She did that test in school where they had you bend over. And they said, oh, you have a curve in your spine. She goes, oh, what do I do? She goes, go to the doctor. Went to the doctor, he took an x-ray. He goes, oh, yeah, you have a curve in your spine. We're just going to watch it and see if it gets what? Right. Is it insanity? Like, imagine I'm your oncologist, and I'm not professing this over here, but imagine if I'm your oncologist, and I said, well, we just did a test, and we found that you actually have a tumor in your breast, and we're just going to watch it and see if it gets worse. Like, you would probably punch the oncologist in the face, right? <laughs> and then walk right out of there and find something that made sense. If I'm your dentist, and I say, hey, you have a, a, a cavity, but we're just going to watch it and see if it gets worse. You know it's going to be a root canal. Like, well, if, you're, if, you're, if I'm your mechanic and I say, hey, I'm just going to watch it and see if your transmission gets worse and it's already going out, you'd be like, I need to re-up my AAA because I'm going to be on the freeway somewhere. Like, everything, a pain on our house gets worse. And that, you know, if we don't maintain it. Like, that's the nature of the world. The world breaks down. And that's not going to magically start to correct itself. Like, that's the thing that we have to understand about the subluxation. It's a progressive, relentless, degenerative neurospinal disease that continues to get worse over time unless corrected. Literally, every single day, subluxations are caused by emotional stresses, physical stresses, chemical stresses. These stresses impact our nervous system, and our nervous system adapts. And that's the, re the result of the, the, the impacts to the environment that we live in there. And so when we adjust somebody, what happens is, is that we, it, it literally takes away the scars from the, ner the, the stresses that we have in our nervous system. But the problem is those stresses, if we don't change our lifestyle, that that's, if, then the this, this same patterns will recreate themselves. And so my job is to reduce subluxation to its most minimal form. Uh, we'll never be able to completely eradicate it because if you don't have stress, you're not alive. But it's like, it's a, you know, you can come to me, pretend I'm your dentist. If you only went to the dentist and you never brushed your teeth, right? And you never flossed, but you went to the dentist four times a year, you'd still lose your teeth. Does that make sense? Maybe slower, but if you brush and you floss, then the, your need for the dentist becomes less. His job is to just to take you up to that next level. And so the thing is, what we're going to give you, our, adjust, our office is very different on how we adjust people. It's a five-part protocol. You have your warm-up process. The warm-up process is to help your body warm up. It's you know, coming in, sitting in the car, and traffic, and all these different things. It's going to be tight and, and restricted. The patterns that we've been, lit, been sitting in, um, but they need to be um, changed. So that's we have our warm-up process to hydrate the disc, to get your spine prepared for the adjustment. And so that when you come to the table, we're going to lay you down on the table, and we're going to adjust you not based on where it hurts. We're going to adjust you based on where you need to be adjusted. That's why we did an exam. Does it make sense? That's why we took the scan. That's why we did x-rays. That's why I took the x-rays. I marked up the x-rays. And then we adjusted you, and then we took a follow-up picture to see how your body responded so that we can actually have a plan. We're going to take that plan, we're going to work that plan, and then we're going to reevaluate it. Like, I want to know if we're making the corrections. And if we're making the corrections, fantastic. And then we're going to keep on doing what we're doing until we get you back to where you should have been in the first place. And if we're not, then we're going to ask some questions, like, what's going on? What are you not doing, or what are you doing? What am I not doing? I mean, I, like, to, to be honest, like, maybe I missed something, but very rarely do I do. But you ask my wife, I'm not perfect. Uh, the point is, is that like, it's, it's a process that we're going to go through. And I can't do this by myself. It's not Dr. Osborne do everything. And so when we look at, and I, the reason why, oh, the, the third part of the adjustment, by the way, is we're going to use vibration platforms and body weighting systems. Because what that's going to do is the best adjustment that you get is the one that you keep. And that's a big thing, because a lot of times you get adjusted, you go sit in the car and you, you leave, and you don't get the chance to lock that adjustment into place. The fifth part is we're going to give you home care exercises. Absolutely critical. And it, what studies show that within the, the first part of your care, your body's going to hold the adjustment for about 12 hours. So if we give you home care exercises, now we're going to be creating a forward momentum. 
as we start to get more stability, it'll go up to about 24 hours, then it'll go up to about 36, then it'll go up to about 72 hours there. But as long as we floss our teeth and brush our teeth with our home care exercises in between, we'll be able to make corrections at a faster rate there. If we don't, it's just like you might as well just keep seeing the dentist on a weekly basis. Does that make sense? And that's, that's the key that we're going to get through. So think about Ann though, and what I want you to understand is that um, I asked myself this question, and this is really what shifted me. Uh, what if I had seen her when she was 15, 16 years old? Right? So she lives across the street now. There's some white apartments over there. Um, she drives a red rascal scooter. She's on disability. She's 53 years old. Um, she has a nasal cannula with oxygen going there. She has her whole entire spine fused there. She drinks all of her food through a blender because these nerves go to her digestive organs there. She's on anti-anxiety medications, she's on antidepressants there, she's on digestive medications there, she's had a, a, like, she has a heart arrhythmia there. These nerves right here go to the heart. And like, I look and I see, she's literally sucking air and pumping blood. So what would her life have looked like if I got to her when she was 16? Or what if I got to her when she was 10, or five, or two? And then you're gonna see a lot of one year old, one year olds and two year olds running around the office here. It's not that they ha don't have problems, we just want to make sure that they aren't ants in the future. In fact, I was on a radio interview recently, and the, the, the interviewer asked me, he said, so what's your greatest miracle? And I said, uh, just point blank, I said that all my patients that have never had cancer, all my patients that have never had heart disease, and we've had, you see the testimonials over there, like we have patients that, that you know, we help them with their cancer, we help them with their heart disease, we get them off their meds and stuff like that, but it's my patients that never get to that point in the first place. That's the miracle. That, that's normal, that's what's supposed to happen. That's the, we think that's a miracle over here in this commonly accepted place, but it's not the miracle in the common sense place. The common sense place that says your body is brilliant and powerful. You cut yourself, it heals. It doesn't need a doctor to tell you how to heal. Like you go to a corpse and you cut it, it doesn't heal. And the only difference between you and a corpse is life flows through you into your body. The power that made your body flows through your body there. So. When I look at like a spine, like I said, it's a progress. The subluxation is a progressive, relentless degenerative condition. Literally, this curve right here is what we call the arc of life. This is what a normal spine looks like. You need to have this 45 degree curve here. 100% of the nerves from your brain flow into your body through this area. That's why they call it the arc of life. Your spinal cord, when it's like that, is going to be nice and round like that. It's, it's for the bandwidth, like literally in Silicon Valley talk, you know, this is, a, this is like a hose. And the, the bandwidth, the amount of information, the data that can come from your brain into your body is at 100% right there. Second thing that we want to look at is this. This is what's called your degeneration progression line. So as that head comes forward, as that head comes forward, do you know what we call that? Nursing home posture, right? So you walk into a nursing home and how does everybody stand? They don't stand like that, right? Nobody stands like this in a nursing home. If they did, they wouldn't be in the nursing home. But as you go into the nursing home, they call it nursing home posture because you start like this, then you go like this, then you go like this, right? And then you kind of do this type of thing for a while. Actually, no, you go like this, and then you go to this, and then you just kind of lay in bed like that. And, and the point is, is that everybody in there, they all have one thing in common. They, 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 some may have cancer, some may have heart disease, some may have diabetes, some may have Alzheimer's, but the one thing that they all have is this nursing home posture. In fact, they actually looked in nursing homes, they did a study, and they found out the greatest predictor of mortality when they studied 1,400 people in nursing homes was the, how far forward their head was. It wasn't their family history. It wasn't their, you know, their, 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 their personal health issue. It wasn't whether they had high cholesterol or low cholesterol, or high blood pressure or low blood pressure. They literally took an x-ray of their neck and measured how far forward their head was. It's critical. So what we look at is we want to have this line right through the front of this vertebra. For every inch that it's forward, it's an extra eight to 10 pounds that your head weighs. So if you take a bowling ball, and you just move it forward like that, it gets infinitely heavier there. Problem with that is, is that you can hold it. It's not the weight of it, but it's how long you have to hold it for. Because eventually, as it comes like this, eventually you can't walk around like this. You have to do this. Third thing right here, most critical area. So there's three things, the curve, the degeneration progression line, and this area right here. I call it the Christopher Reeves area. And the reason being is this, is, this bone right here is the area that Christopher Reeves broke. He was riding his horse, right? You guys remember the story? He was riding his horse, fell down, hit his chin, 
and uh, and ended up in a wheelchair, like more than a wheelchair. He could use his arms and his legs. Well, he didn't have an arm and his leg, or arm and leg problem. He had a nervous system issue. His arms and his legs were completely fine. He had to have a pacemaker stuck in his heart immediately, not because he had a bad heart or he inherited stuff or he ate pork rinds or went to In and Out Burger every week. It was because he had a he had a nervous system issue. He had to have a bag stuck in his intestines, not because he couldn't afford good food. It was because your nervous system controls your intestines, and they cause the intestines to contract, and they, they cause the secretion of the, 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 the food there. If you put organic food into his intestines, it would have just rotted. That's why they had to stick a bag into his intestines. Literally, and if you talk to his doctor, his doctor said that he aged 30 years in the nine years that he was alive. That's, you look at him right after the accident, he looked like Superman, right? And then nine years later, he's just like this corpse sitting in a chair that, you know, could barely move a finger. Well, when we look at this area, we need to see twice the amount of space between here and here that we see between here and here. That area is this area right here. This is your brain stem right there. It controls heart rate, it controls respiration, it controls your body's ability to deal with stress and anxiety. It controls all of your hormones in your entire body there. It regulates your body's temperature. It, it is literally the, the keystone of your, of, your, of your nervous system before it enters into the body. This is a regulatory center right here. So if we have damage here, it's going to damage everything else down below there. So if your neck looks like this, what do we want to do? But if, that's, if that was your neck, what would you, what would you do? You celebrate it. Celebrate and keep it like that. Does that make sense? Like if you go to the dentist and he says, hey, um, you have no cavities, nobody says, oh, fine. I don't have to brush my teeth anywhere. This is great, right? You're not good. I'm going to keep flossing and double up on it. Problem is, is that this, like I said, it's a progressive. And look at the space. See how there's less space right here, and see how there's more space here. What happens is that we start to lose the curve right there. You'll start to see the bones will start to change shape. The discs will start to thin out there, and you'll start to see the head comes forward. This was actually a, a like a, a, a picture. Um, a, of a series of 13 pi uh, pictures of one lady over 13 years. What happened was is that she went into the doctor and she had really bad headaches. And so you can see the pressure on the vein stem that causes headaches there. She goes in there and then she starts to have neck pain. Well, the, his recommendation to her, by the way, was to take ibuprofen, which is great. Yeah, that makes sense. Unfortunately, what he didn't tell her was that ibuprofen, the way that it works, is it actually shuts down your brain stem. That's why when you have a, a, like a fever and you take ibuprofen, it lowers your temperature because it, in, it shuts down your brain stem so your body can't regulate its own temperature. It, it, it like interferes with it there. They don't tell you that ibuprofen, when they study people, they did a major study and they found that your, it shuts down your body's, people's ability to empathize with other human beings. Can you imagine? 27 billion pills are taken in the United States every year and people that take it aren't able to empathize with another human being. I wonder why we have school shootings there. You know, no wonder my families are falling apart there. And what they didn't tell you is that when you take ibuprofen, it accelerates the rate of spinal degeneration and disc degeneration by a factor of four. Four times greater rate of degeneration than if somebody didn't take it there. That's scary. But it's just over the counter. It's gotta be safe, right? And I can keep going because it's the number one cause of liver failure in the United States right now. Forget drinking, ibuprofen is. So when we look at this, what we start to see is over time, she started to have more and more pain. Over 13 years, you can start to see the disc starting to degenerate there. Imagine if somebody, if a chiropractor had actually looked at that x-ray, they would been like, oh, you have a subluxation right here in your spine. Let's get it adjusted and get you back to where you should have been in the first place. So what I want you to, the reason why I point this out and I, I talk about degeneration, it's, our, when we look at our x-rays, they are what they are. Them. We can't go back in time. Like, if I could, I would. Somebody asked me, we were talking today, and I was joking around. I said, if I could go back in time, I would. Be, he said, well, what would you do? And I said, I'd be a chiropractor. Because I get to all my patients that I have right now and adjust them before they ever had any problems there, and then they'd be like expressing incredible health. But as the spine degenerates, so do the spinal cord and the nerves. And that's why I care about it. So when we look at a spine right here, curve or no curve? No curve, right? Space or no space? Right, so look right here. So now the brain stem's pulling down on the back, on the, on the base of the, the atlas right there. Literally, think about this, as I lose that curve, pretend this is my spinal cord, and this is my, my neck curve. As I lose the curve, you see what's happening? 
stretching and crushing like a pair of Chinese handcuffs on that uh, on that spinal cord there, and it's literally pulling down on the brain. Can you guys imagine any scenario where pulling down on your brain on your spinal cord is a good idea? The average kid, five thousand hours a year on their computers or their, uh, or their laptops right now. Uh, I'm seeing problems now in kids that are 13 or 14 years old with disc issues and the generation in their spine that I didn't even see until people are in their 30s and 40s, uh, 50s when I, when I first started practice. It's ridiculous. But, and, and so when we look at somebody like this, no space there. But so let's say, or do a scenario. This person goes to their doctor and they're walking to their doctor. And they're like, doc, I'm just feeling really depressed. And he's going like, okay, well, it's not your fault. It's just a brain issue. No, you got a brain issue. It's, you, it's, there's a hormone called serotonin. And so your serotonin levels are low. Um, and, and so what we need to do is we need to raise those serotonin levels up, and then you're going to be happy. That's just the way it's going to be. And you're like, great, fantastic. They don't tell you that the Prozac or the Wellbutrin or the Zoloft that you take, one of the side effects is anxiety. So you're going to also have to take a, a second medication to actually get rid of the anxiety that you'll get from the antidepressants there, but he also doesn't ask you two simple questions. Where is serotonin produced? And you're not allowed to answer that question. It's right here, in the intestines. 90% of the serotonin in your body is produced in your intestines. So does he ask you about your diet? Does he, does he ask you, like, like toxicity there? Does he look at anything in your intestines? And in fact, psychiatry is one of those really interesting things because the way that they diagnosed President Lincoln 170 years ago is the same way that they diagnose you today. They're just guessing. There's no test. You can't test for serotonin. They're just guessing. Well, if it's a serotonin issue and it's too low, well, why don't we look at where it produces serotonin? And, and serotonin is actually regulated right up in the brainstem. So why don't we look at what regulates serotonin? But the way our thinking is, is let's just like chemistry. This is a structural issue. If somebody subluxated there, those, are those intestines going to work and are they going to be able to make serotonin? No. And so you look at this person, how long is this person going to have to be on their antidepressant for? Probably forever, right? So that's why when we look at it, it's, it's not that they're bad people, it's just that the pharmaceutical industry is more concerned about their, their stockholders' health than your health. They, 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 have, they have a vested interest and you being on your medications for a long time, and that way, the way that we think um, is, that feeds right into that. So what we want to look at is, this is what the spinal cord looks like. So now we have these kids that are, our heads are, their heads are down, stretching their spinal cord, disassociated, putting pressure on there. No wonder we're the number one country in the world for depression, right? We're the number one country in the world right now for anxiety disorders. We're the number one country in the world for mood disorders. Well, of course, their brain's being deformed as you're pulling down on that. Unfortunately, the next phase one right here is, is fully correctable. Like, if we're in phase one, boom, let's just get to work, get it corrected there. Um, and then let's maintain it there for as long as you want to maintain it. Now, the big thing is, is that people ask me all the time, like, well, how long do you have to be in here? I'm like, I don't know. Just don't do go. If you go back and do the same things that you did to get yourself in this first place, why would things be any different? Does that make sense? If, if you lose a whole bunch of weight, you're like, oh my gosh, I have six-pack abs, and then you go start eating at Burger King and you know get double doubles at in and out all the time, and then you're like, why am I gaining weight? Well, it's because you stopped doing all the things that got you that position in the first place. If it's working, keep working. The 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 problem though is is that the next phase is what we call phase two. Phase two is an uncorrected phase one. That's basically what it is. Phase one, there's no symptoms. So because there's really no symptoms. I don't get to see a lot of people in phase one. And that's a problem. And that's why about a decade ago, what I started, what I did is I said, that no more, this is insane. So when somebody starts in my office, within the first week of care, if they start in the office, I'll check the rest of their family at no charge. Then, like, not that I don't have anything else to do, I'm plenty busy, but it's because it's the right thing to do. Because if you don't know, you don't have a choice. If your kid, like, do you know, have, do you have an x-ray of your kids next? Does it make sense? Do you know what their atlas angle is? Do you know what their spine looks like? And do you know what it's going to look like in 10 or 20 years from now? And if they, and if they live in Colorado, I'll find them somebody in Colorado. If they live in Connecticut, we'll find them somebody in Connecticut. Um, if, you know, and if they live literally next door to this office, like, they don't have to come here. I'll find them somebody down the street to get them checked. But the point is, is that it, like, if, imagine if we start with families and we take care of one family and then they get, they, we have a healthy family 
and they're they're connected and they're not on drugs and they're not I had a one lady that, that, that one family that literally was eating at Burger King every day. That's where I met them. That was the second family. And the reason why they were eating at Burger King, they used to have the two for two. They get two hamburgers, two fries for two bucks. Because the the the, the, the dad and the, the four of the kids, like sixteen and the mom and the dad were on so much insulin that they they were spending a vast majority of their income just on their medications there. And it, their whole medication, their medical bills every every month was taking up 75% of their income. They were partially living in and out of homeless shelters and in their car. And so we actually took care of them for free to get them off of that. But the point is, is that phase two is an uncorrected phase one. And what we see is that the discs start to degenerate. They start to thin out there. The bones start to change. And when those bones start to change, not only do they grow forward, but they grow backwards. So now somebody says, well, I'm just getting older. I just don't have the same energy. And, that I used to. You, yeah, of course you don't. There's no way, is there any way energy can flow through that structure? It's like just putting your foot on the hose and expecting like the water to come out the same. And at first the, the hose goes to the grass and the ha grass isn't going to turn brown all of a sudden, but eventually what's going to happen is that bra grass will turn brown. So it's a green grass, brown grass issue. The quicker that you take your foot off the hose, the quicker that the, 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 the body is able to regenerate. And that's the thing you have to understand. When we adjust you, Healing is an instantaneous event. It happens the moment that we adjust somebody. Regeneration, though, takes time. The amount of time that you have pressure on, the, on your nervous system determines the amount of uh, like six cells that your body has. And so the amount of six cells, it's going to take time, depending on how subluxated you were, how much damage was done. Over time, your body will regenerate. The thing that you have to understand is that within two weeks, a subluxation is actually, they, they can actually see permanent degenerative changes on an x-ray. Within six months, I mean, within six weeks, they can see major nerve damage on it. And within six months, there's permanent nerve damage. So if health is 100% function, and we've been subluxated for six months, and now we're, I don't know, 0.1% off, we never get that 0.1% back. It's, it, the, the, there's permanent nerve damage there. If it's, it's a year or two years, five years, what is, and most people when they come in, they're 20, 30, 40 years and too late for their first you know, adjustment there. And so that's why I look at families, because if I don't, then I keep on seeing the same thing coming. Maybe my son, when he's a chiropractor, will see the people that I didn't get checked while they're there. And that's what my, that's what, that's, it's, uh, that's my greatest fear. Phase two, by the way, is we can expect pretty much 100%, about 90% correction. That's what our goal is, to get to 90% because when we're at 90%, we can actually withstand gravity. Anything less than 90% gravity wins. So, um, let's look at this picture right here. What do you guys see on this picture? Let's, let's, let's start here. Space or no space? No space. You see that? Like, it's just like jammed up there. Um, and then how about the curve? She's got a curve here, and you see how it comes straight down there? So when you look at your x-rays, it's space or no space, curve or no curve, and you look at her weight-bearing line, look at how far forward that is. So healthy or sick? Big time, right? So this is a 14-year-old girl, uh, soccer player. Um, this is her spine when we took a picture of her right here. Um, she's played soccer since she was six years old. Um, she has, you know, and one of the things about soccer, obviously, heading. And, you know, just a great athlete there. Then she started feeling sick. She started having, I think it was digestive disorders. Next thing you know, this kid is, she's been to, she's had CAT scans and she's had, brain scans and she's they, they're looking for cancer they're looking for something they're looking for lymphoma they're looking for all these things hundred thousand dollars in medical bills hundred thousand dollars in medical bills on a 14 year old in the meantime she's dropped out of school she's like being homeschooled but she can't even like study she's getting sicker and sicker finally somebody said something to her just like they said something to you like no, nobody here just walked into the office does it make sense somebody said something and cared enough about you so they bring her in and i showed the parents the pictures of the x-rays here's the thing we started working with her. This is her post picture, by the way. This is her about a year later. Um, this is her before. This is her after there. Healthy or sick? She, yeah, she's, she's back playing soccer. She's back at school. She's on student council. They, 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 they Literally, they spent maybe $1,800 in here, and, and they found a solution rather than spending $100,000 and only getting more questions there. Because we can test and we can test and we can test it. If we don't know what we're looking for, we can spend a million dollars testing if you don't know what you're looking for. But if you, my grandfather used to always say that there's, 
you know, we, we, we had a whole bunch of uh, fruit trees. We were farmers. We had about a thousand acres in the valley at one time. And we'd walk through the apricot orchards, and, and he's from Yugoslavia, and they say, well, it's the fruit, not the root. And that's the thing that I need to understand, is that well, a lot of times somebody comes into it with a heart issue, we look at the fruit, and we think that's the problem. That's the root. It was never the fruit on the tree. It was always the tree's problem. we got to find out what was happening. Here she is. Here's her post picture from the front. Parents are like, you know what, Dr. Osborne? Um, we were doing a, a reevaluation on it. They said, you know, I just want to let you know this is our last visit. I said, what are you talking about? She said, yeah, it, you know, it's just it's so hard to get here from Palo Alto, and we're just so busy. You know, she's, we're going out on weekends, and we're, we're going, uh, we're, you know, we're traveling on our soccer team now. She's got all these things going on at school, and, you know, school's so busy. And I said, are you kidding me? Like, where do you think she's going to be? And that's the thing is that we do things many times in crisis, but we never get the full juice out of life. A lot of times, if you think about it, right, so right here, most people, is this is what we call the I'm fine zone. How you doing? I'm fine. Yeah. Think about this, like, how's your relationship with, you know, your spouse? Oh, uh, it's fine. That's, that's, like, scary. You know what I mean? That means that you haven't gotten flowers in a long time. There's, you know, nobody's told you I love you. It's just we're co we're coexisting there. The problem is, is that a lot of times you go to the doctor, he's like, how are you doing on a scale of 1 to 10? And you're like, oh, you know, I'm about 6 out of 10 for pain. Great. And then you get back down to zero, and you're like, oh, thanks, doc. And he says goodbye. That's what I used to be. Like, you would come into my office, and I'd say, um, how are you doing? And they're like, doc, I'm great. I'm like, hey, give me a call when your back hurts again. But then after I saw enough patients breaking down over time, and after I saw my dad, who I treated like that, die of heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's at 56 years old, I switched. I'm like, I can't let that happen to another person. Because what I realized is not a scale of 1 to 10, it's a scale of negative 10 to 0, and a negative 0 to plus 10. Down here at negative 10, it's on your death door. Uh, you know, most people, they, you get sick, you're like at a negative 1, and what do you do? You, you start eating right, you start exercising, you start, I mean, you start, you get your sleep, you do all the right things, just so you can get back to a big fat 0. You, 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 the way sickness works is that you don't go from healthy to sick, you go from healthy too unhealthy, too sick. And then most people, they try to get from sick back, just back to being unhealthy, sick back to being just unhealthy, and what they do is they slowly work their way down in those directions. My job, wherever you are right here, is not to keep you down here. This is medicine's job, is just to make you comfortable being sick. My job is to get you to a zero, back to where you should have been, and then keep moving all the way up here into plus 10. That's what we call a maximized life. That's my goal there. So this right here is my least successful case that I've ever had. Even though a miracle occurred, even though she got her life back, I know that in 30 years she's not going to be healthy. I fail. And so my job is to make sure that I take care of you, give you guys the tools and the understanding to make sure that, look, once we get you back where you should be, let's just maintain it there. Last picture I'm going to show you is this. And um, just so you know, as you can tell, I love what I do. Um, in fact, I, I was a patient. Like that's how I got into chiropractic because I lost everything. I was I lost. I was a, a championship wrestler and I ended up dislocating my shoulder, hurting my. And I couldn't keep that shoulder into place. They were going to stick a pin into my shoulder, um, and I was, was not going to be able to wrestle again. And my mom said, "Hey, let's go to a chiropractor." I went to a chiropractor. And he said, "Look, you don't have a shoulder. She got a nerve issue. You got pressure on the nerve. What do we need to do?" And I said, "I don't want to take the pressure off." He said, "Yeah." So because of that, I ended up going on to state the next year. And because I went to state that year, I ended up going to state the next year. Because of that, I got a wrestling scholarship for college. Because of that, I met my wife my first day of college. Because I met my wife my first day of college, I ended up having my two kids. Here I am, you know, 24 years later, actually probably 30-something 30, 30 years later. And because of that one chiropractor did that one thing, it completely transformed my life. And so that's what that's why I, I'm wow. passionate. If you, if you need, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's so if I'm a chiropractor 24 seven, like if you need me, call me, text me, email me. Like my team is amazing. That's why we're going to continue education, not because we they need to be trained, like I that, that they're not. I want them to be the very best. All of them used to we're, we're patients. All of them sat right there in those chairs. All of them asked to be able to work here because they they care about other people. They're passionate. They have their own personal miracles, and so. The thing that, for that to happen though, it, it, we gotta have rules. And the first rule that I want to make sure that we're in agreement with is that, that you're responsible for your health. 
I am not responsible for your health. I refuse to take responsibility for your health. I will walk alongside you. I will not push you. I will not pull you. I'm not going to make you do anything. I'm not going to stick my knee in your back there. Because if I'm responsible for your health, this is what it looks like. I go shopping for you, and then I buy you the right food, and then I go home, and I cook the food for you, and I cut it up in nice little bits, and I feed it to you, right? And then I, I, I shut your laptop, and I tell you it's 10 o'clock, you need to go put Netflix away, you don't need to watch Breaking Bad, you know, like number 47, right? And, and then you go to bed, and then I wake you up eight hours later, and I make you go exercise. In fact, I'll do your exercise for you. But if, I, if that was what I did, then guess what's going to happen? I'm not there, you're right back to where you started. And I don't want to waste time. I don't want to waste your time, because here's the thing, if you look at what health is, it's our most valuable asset, right? Like, if you lose your health, you lose everything. If you lose, like, you lose your health, you lose your 401k, we lose our cars, we lose our scholarships. And when we have our health, we can get it all back. And the thing that's important, if you look at, like, Steve Jobs, you can't buy it back once you lose it. You don't get it back. You had $16 billion. You'd think with $16 billion, you could buy your health back. Yeah, it was given to you free. You didn't do anything to deserve it. You got it as a free gift, and it's yours to take care of. It's a precious talent there, and it's, and it's a temple that you got to protect there. Did you read his last kind of statement to everybody? No. It was this week. All right. You should read it. Okay. He Which almost pretty much verbatim said what he said. Okay. Yeah, check it is, yeah, it doesn't matter about money. It's your health, and take care of yourself. And and then the problem is, is that when we're sick, who pays the price? All the people around us. Yeah. Does that make sense? There, you look at, and that's the biggest challenge. So I look at not taking responsibility for our health as being very selfish, because you're somebody's going to have to pay the price for you eventually. There. Second rule is get your family checked. Um, I, I can't imagine somebody starting care in my office and not getting their family checked. It just makes no sense. Like, why would you? If it's good enough, if, if everything I'm saying is true, then then. Then you would want to get your family checked. But if it's not, like if, if pressure on your nervous system is a good thing, if degeneration in your spine is going to help you live a longer, healthier, happier life, then go ahead and do that. But it's either it's a black or white issue. It's either 100% right or 100% wrong. It's just a principle there. And so if the principle is right, then get your family checked. And the reason why I do this also is I had a grandma that was in phase three, and she and I showed her actually she starts crying, and I said, "Well, what's going on?" She's like, "She goes, what do I do now?" I said, "Go home, get your grandkids." Bring them in here, let's check them so they don't end up like you. And the last thing is this, is that, and that's why I put this x-ray up, this, this office is about a mission. Like, I'm on a mission to change the way that people perceive and receive their health care. Like, and, and if we can do that, we can save millions of lives in the process there. And, and, and we can end needless suffering. The, the prayer lists are getting longer at church, you know, there's people on their, on their knees just begging for an answer. Each one of you is here because somebody said something to you, just like Brandon. And Brandon, if you can get a vision of what he looks like, he's, and in fact, he's the little boy that's on the wall down there. You'll see a picture on the far table. Brandon was, his dad came in, and Brandon was, it was in this room. Brandon was sitting in a chair over there, and I walked into the room, and I had my file there, and I looked at Brandon, and I started talking to him, and I forgot about the dad. I said, do you mind if I, I didn't even know him. I said, do you mind if I check your son? He goes, oh. He's got brain damage, you know, there's not much you can do for him. I said, well, what happened? He told me that his mom took drugs when she was pregnant, and long story, and I said, look, if he's got brain damage, how important do you think it is to have 100% of those messages getting down? Here's what Brandon looks like. He's got braces on his legs. He's got a big, huge, distended belly. He's got a condition called gastric hypermotility syndrome, where literally his dad had to give him a suppository every night to go to the bathroom. He had... Uh, he, he had big, thick Coke bottle glasses, and his eyes were coming in. Uh, like, and I'm talking the thick ones, and his eyes were in like this. And like, sometimes if he wanted to see you, he had to cover his eye up to be able to like, see clearly there. Um, hardest part was is that he, had, he couldn't talk. He just talked like this. Uh, like just, there was real difficulty communicating. So I took a picture of him. This is what his x-ray looked like. This is what a four-year-old's x-ray looked like. How old was he? Four years old. <laughs> No curve. This right here, see how it comes at, at a sharp angle there? That's what birth trauma looks like. Tough birth. Tough birth. Cord wrapped around his neck. They pulling, pulling, pulling. Next thing you know, he's born. Now they say, oh my gosh, it's a, it, you know, not enough oxygen getting to the brain. Of course there's not enough oxygen. There's pressure on the, the nervous system interfering with the, how his body's breathing there. Start adjusting him. Um, 
about two months into it, there's no pain, by the way. Whether if he did, we couldn't tell. He ends up, it does, it, Dad says he's walking without his braces. And you have to understand, he's got bruises on his face. He's got chipped teeth because he doesn't just walk. He face plants on the ground like they did an IEP in school, and he had he was falling on average 17 times an hour when he was walking on the assisted bed. So for him to have his braces off, that's a miracle. He goes to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, no, you have to wear those braces. You got to wear it. But Dad's like, are you serious? My kid's walking, and he doesn't have his braces on now. About three months later, he ends up, the dad's like, I don't have to give him his suppositories anymore to go to the bathroom. His stomach is completely flat. He's able to digest his food there. And then I remember one time we were laying on the table, he didn't want to put his glasses on there. Um, he didn't want to put his glasses on because they hurt his eyes now. And he was able to see better without his glasses than with his glasses. About a year into it, he's able to start to form words. Fast forward five years. So Brandon now has a video blog that he's been doing um, for the last year now. He's a, uh, uh, in which he, he, he talks, he was the senior patrol leader of a scout troop. He just finished uh, uh, going to Philmont, which is a, a hundred mile hike through Philmont there. Um, he's on the, uh, the swim team, the varsity swim team uh, at, a school, at a school, and he just moved out to Louisiana. Um, so you look at this kid, and you say that he's broken. He's not broken, he's just interfered with. There's nothing, like, are we are brilliant and powerful? And when we're not expressing it, that means that there's something that was interfering with. Remember this, this, the eclipse that happened the other day? The sun didn't disappear. There was just something interfering with it. That's, that's all you have to look at. Health is always there at 100%. And if you're not expressing it, that just means that there's something interfering with that health experiencing it. The reason why I care about Brandon is this, three, two things. Number one, his birthday is two days away from my son's birthday. They're the exact same age. And I look at my kid, my son, he was adjusted right at birth. And I like this other child that had to wait for four weeks, I mean four years. Brandon now speaks completely fluent. He, he actually come and spoke at some of my dinners and some of my uh, like my, my seminars that I put on there. A whole crowd of like 300 people and it's just, he's an amazing kid. But the point is, is that because what would his life have looked like if we had, he would have just been like Anne, he would have just been like this other girl that was on there. Second thing though is, is that when Brandon was sitting at, his dad and Brandon were sitting right there, Bob was sitting right here, and his dad looks up and he goes, hey Bob, what are you doing here? And he goes, I've been like coming here for 10 years. And Brandon's dad, you have to understand, is a big, huge guy, bald head, weightlifter, and he comes over and he gets in his face. He's like, you mean to tell me that you've been coming here for 10 years and you saw everything that I was going through and he didn't say anything. And he's like yelling at him. And he goes, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you say something? And I had to come and separate him at this point. But the point was is that, that Bob sat there and he said, I just didn't think he wanted to know. Of course people want to know. It's not your choice to make a decision whether they want to get healthy or not or they want to know. It's, it's your responsibility. If you know a truth, then you speak a truth. If you don't speak that truth, that's just a sin of omission. It's not a sin of commission. It's a sin of omission there. And so that's why we have classes, that's why we have dinners, that's why we do all the things that we do so that we can make an impact in the world. And so really the last thing that I, I the, the last thing that I ask is commitment. I don't want you to be committed to me. I, I want you to be committed. Commitment is not this, it's this. Like I and so I want you to be committed to your health. There's gonna be hard times. Does that make sense? There'll be like work will get busy and then you just have to deal with it and and, and and, and, and we'll figure it out. Does that make sense? When we start teaching about the nutrition plans and how to eat right, it's going to be hard at first because you're so used to doing things that you've always done, but those things aren't leading you to where you want to go there. And there will be hard times, but that's when you go through that, that's what builds your character. That's what builds your momentum there. And so when we go back to the rooms, really, really like the only thing that I really care about is if you're committed to your health. Um, because if you are, we can work through anything. We can, we can push through anything. But the, the other thing that I ask is this, is that uh, when we look at the pictures, I want you to be able to be the doctor tonight. I want you to be able to tell me exactly what you see, um, you know, what it's affecting. And really, you know, not just with, whether you want to give it correct or not, you already know that, but you know, whether you're committed, that's all I ask, okay? So let me go grab your files, and then I'll meet you right in the room, so. Hang on one sec.